Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. We're ready to begin our Torah class. <clears throat> and the Torah portion this week is Vayeshev, which if you're in the Blue Oscar Chumash, you can find it on page 198. So here we come to one of the most famous stories in the entire Torah, Joseph and the brothers, or as the famous uh, play, uh, Joseph and his multi-colored coat. And it's the story of the 12 tribes of Israel and the brothers of Joseph and how they were envious of him because he had these lofty dreams that he would relate to his brothers that would irritate them and upset them and anger them. And it all begins with Yaakov the opening verse says, Yaakov came back to the land of Israel. That if you remember the past few weeks, we learned about how Jacob had fled from his brother Esau's wrath. He had spent 20 years in the house of Laban. And now some 22 years later, he comes home. And he had a hard life running from his brother, putting up with his father-in-law's shenanigans. And finally, he settles down. Life is good. It's peaceful because he made peace with his brother Esau. He's back home in his ancestral land of Israel where his parents lived. He has a beautiful family, 12 sons and a daughter. He can't ask for any more. He's happy, he's wealthy, successful. Everything's going great. And just as things be settle down, Vayeshev Yaakov, Vayeshev means Yaakov dwelled, it means he, he was settled, not just that he physically settled, but he settled emotionally, he's like, okay, I went through my hardships in life, but now life is good, I've reached a point where I could, so to speak, uh, take it easy, or enjoy the rest of my life, no more struggles, no more hardships, and just at that point, Little did he know that he was going to begin a very traumatic time in his life because his beloved son, Joseph. Now, remember, the woman he loved most, Rachel, only gave him two sons, Joseph, who was the firstborn of Rachel, and Benjamin. And this son, Joseph, who was the apple of his eye, who he loved so much, who he made a coat of many colors for, was going to be ripped away from him, and he's going to be presumably dead. And he will only be reunited with him 22 years later when Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers when they come to purchase food. And once again, father and son are reunited. And our rabbis tell us, or actually the verse tells us, but the rabbis explain it, that normally, God forbid, when someone loses a loved one, there are different stages of grief and mourning. We have the seven-day period, the 30-day period, the, the year. But eventually, God created human nature that while we never forget our loved ones, we don't remain permanently stuck in grief. We're able to progress with our lives and not become paralyzed by the sadness and the grief. However, our rabbis say that the verse says that Jacob refused to be consoled over the loss of his son, Joseph. And the reason was because even though the brothers reported to their father that we found the multicolored coat of Joseph dipped him, and they dipped it in goat's blood to look like an animal, tore him apart, murdered him, killed him. And the, the storyline that Joseph was dead was what Jacob was led to believe. But since the fact was that he was not dead, that he was alive, the blessing that God created in human nature that we could go on from a loss and function in this world and not remain stuck permanently in grieving. There are different degrees and stages, but eventually life goes on. That blessing of human nature did not take effect because that only occurs when someone is actually dead. But since Joseph was alive, even though it was unbeknownst to the father Jacob, his heart didn't allow him to be ever consoled over the loss of his son. So God forbid, imagine the intense mourning that a mourner feels for the first 30 days or seven days or 30 days or a year of grief. Imagine Jacob had to live with that perpetual degree of grief 
over the loss of his child, his beloved child, Joseph, for 22 years. So Joseph, Jacob is about to face another very difficult chapter in his life. But of course, at the end, he'll be reunited with his son. And for the last 17 years of his life, he will live in Egypt, reunited with his entire family. But how does the story begin? And sadly, this is a story of the shortcomings of human nature, that even brothers sometimes can have envy and jealous towards each other. And the Talmud says we have to learn from this story. Lesson number one, don't ever treat one child different than the other children. Yaakov made a fatal mistake by making a special coat of many colors, ketonet pasim, for Joseph that he didn't make for the other sons. And that created jealousy and hatred towards Joseph. Sometimes we think that by giving one child something special, we're bestowing extra love on that child because maybe we have more affection for that child. But the fact is we're actually putting them in a position that they're gonna be envied and even hated by their siblings. So we're doing them no favor by giving them something extra. And our rabbis say, look at what happened. A little coat that didn't cost much to make, maybe a few coins, led to the envy and the jealousy and the hatred of the brothers, which led to Joseph being sold, thrown into a pit and then sold into slavery, which eventually led to the Jewish family moving to Egypt. And after Joseph's death, the Jewish family, Jacob's descendants become enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. So rabbis say that because of the few extra coins that Jacob spent on Joseph that he didn't lavish on the other children by making him the coat of many colors, if you follow the chain of events, you'll see that the Jews were enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years of slavery and persecution because of that little coat. Not only did it lead to misery in Joseph's life that he had to go through imprisonment and, and slavery, as he became sold as a slave in Egypt and then thrown into prison on top of having been thrown into a pit. But it led to the entire Jewish nation being led into slavery. And therefore, our rabbis say, you should never arouse jealousy amongst your kids by treating one differently than the others. That is the, um, that is, uh, the, uh, the first lesson of this story. Now, was Yosef also guilty because of this jealousy? So the first thing is, the Torah tells us right away up front on verse three of this week's Torah portion, Yosef as dibasam ra'a which means Yosef was the favorite child of Jacob and he would use this position of favoritism to bring evil reports about them to their father. In other words, anytime he saw the brothers doing something wrong, he would go and report it to the father. That only agitated the brothers even more. And then on top of that, Jacob made a special coat of many colors and gave it to Joseph that he didn't make for any of his other children. And the brothers saw that Jacob loved him more than all the children and therefore they hated him and they could not speak to him peacefully. On top of all of that, the tattletaling and the coat of many colors Joseph has great dreams. And he tells his brothers about his dreams. And he has two dreams. One is that they were all out in the field collecting their sheaves of grain. And Joseph says, my sheave of grain stood up erect and all of your sheaves of grain bowed down, prostrated themselves to my sheave of grain. And the brother said, what are you trying to tell us? That you're going to rule over us? You're going to be a king over us? We're going to bow down to you? You're our younger brother, and you're saying we're going to bow to you? So they hated him even more because of this dream. Then he had a second dream. And once again, he told his brothers that I dreamt that the sun and the moon and 11 stars are bowing down to me. And they told his father and his brothers, and... The father this time, Jacob, realizes that this is causing animosity amongst the brothers. And the father, Jacob, became enraged, became angry at his son, Joseph. And he said, what are you trying to say? What is this dream that you have? 
Are you implying that not only your brothers, but the sun and the moon and the stars, 11 stars, 11 stars are your 11 brothers. Sun and the moon is father and mother. The appearance are going to bow down to you. What kind of a sun is this? However, the verse says that in Jacob in his heart, even though outwardly he rebuked Joseph for these dreams because he didn't want to create jealousy amongst the brothers or anger, he held it in his heart that, oh, I should only merit to see my son rise to such greatness. Now, of course, all of these dreams came true. Joseph became the viceroy of Egypt and the brothers and the parents came down and they bowed down to him as the ruler of Egypt. But it actually happened in two stages. Whenever you have two dreams in the Torah to bring out the same point, there has to be two dimensions to the message. So the message was that Joseph's going to be a ruler and everyone's going to bow down to him. And of course, that came to be. But what is the two separate dreams? First, the sheaves of grain and then bowing to him. And the answer is that there were two stages and the brothers bowing to Joseph. First, when they came to buy food, they didn't know it was Joseph. And they bowed down to him, not because they respected him, but because they respected the fact that he controls the food. And therefore, if they want food from Egypt, they got to bow to the viceroy. So they were only bowing to his sheaf of grain. They weren't bowing to him personally. And the second dream, they weren't, is already represents the stage after Joseph revealed his identity to his brother and said, I am your brother Joseph, and I harbor no ill will towards you. I have no grudge held against you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to embrace you. I'm not going to take revenge after what you've done to me, put me through. Now they bowed to him, not only because he was the viceroy and he was the most powerful man underneath Pharaoh, but they bowed to him because they saw what a great person he was, that he didn't become bitter. He didn't become cynical and resentful of his brothers. He was willing to forgive all the pain and all the suffering they put him through just to heal the rift and reunite his brothers. So now they bowed not just to him as a one who controls the sheaves of grain. They weren't just bowing to his food, like in the first dream, they were bowing to him personally. And I think this is a very relevant message uh, that we could all think about. You know, in this world, a lot of people bow to other people metaphorically, meaning to say that they give great honor and accolades and praise to other people. But a lot of times they're just bowing to his sheave of grain. So a person is very rich or powerful. People need that person for whatever reason. Uh, business, whatever it is. So they praise the person, they tell him how great he is, and they respect them not because of who they are as a person, but they respect them just because he has a lot of grain, he has a lot of wheat, he has a lot of dough, as they say, he has a lot of power, he has a lot of money, whatever it may be. So it's not really respect for the individual, it's respect for their wealth. However, the second dream represents a much more profound dream that at first people may recognize you for your success, like Joseph was a very successful man and became very powerful. But the ultimate the goal is that no one should respect you because of the power or the money that you have. They should respect you. In other words, when they saw the tr true character of Joseph, they realized they had misjudged them all along. And they didn't realize how great he was. And now they stood in front of him with respect and admiration for the person he was, the human being he was, his capacity to let go of anger, of hate, of uh, you know, grudges against the brothers, and also that he was able to persevere. That's a tremendous uh, trait that Joseph has, resilience. I mean, he was thrown into a pit, he was sold into slavery, he was thrown into prison in Egypt. And despite all of that, he rose to the top to become viceroy of Egypt. All he had was a dream a vision, but his character was so great. And no matter what circumstances in life were thrown at him, he was able to overcome all of them. And Joseph is a very powerful metaphor. You know, people often ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And it's one of the most difficult, uh, unanswerable questions because we don't always understand God's ways. But when you ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? So if you look at the life of Joseph, Joseph goes through so many hardships. And Joseph could have asked, why are bad things happening to me? I'm being thrown into a pit. I'm being 
sold into slavery. I'm being accused falsely in Egypt by my master's wife of trying to seduce her. And then I'm on top of that put into prison in Egypt. But at the end of the story, you know the reason why these things happened to Joseph, because he was destined to become the viceroy of Egypt. And in order to become the viceroy of Egypt, he had to go through these experiences to ultimately, at the end of this week's Torah portion, interpret the dream of the butler and the baker, be taken out of prison to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh is so impressed with his interpretation that he appoints him viceroy of Egypt. And so the route to getting to his realization of his dream went through all these challenges along the way. And at every stage, Joseph should have said, why are bad things happening to me? I'm a good person, which he was. But the answer only became realized at the very end. And so too in life, we sometimes go through hardships and struggles, but we don't always understand why we're going through these challenges. But hopefully at the end, we could look back and say, ah, now I understand why I had to go through this experience because it led me to the uh, circumstances that I needed to be in to fulfill and realize my dreams in life. So going back to the story, he has these dreams. He tells it to the brothers. The brothers are obviously... Uh, very, very uh, angry at him and jealous of him. And one day they're out in the field in Shechem, uh, Nablus. Uh, and they're out in the field of tending to their sheep, to their flock. And they don't come back on time. So Jacob tells Joseph, who's home with his father, your brothers went to pasture the sheep in Shechem, go find them and, you know, call them to come home. And Joseph says, I'm ready to go, dad. Now the word hineni, we find it when God told Abraham to go take Isaac to the binding. Hineni means I'm, I'm ready to follow your word regardless of the personal challenge. Now we understand why, we understand why for Abraham, he used the word hineni, I'm ready to go to the binding. We understand why when Moses was approached by the burning bush, God said, I have a mission for you. Hineni, I'm ready to serve. But here, you know, it's just go call your brothers. What's, what's the big deal? What's the hineni? And obviously, our rabbis say that he knew he was putting himself in a vulnerable position by going out to be alone with the brothers in the field. But if his father sent him, he wasn't going to ask questions. He was ready to go do what his father said. Now, why would Jacob send him in the first place? Perhaps Jacob wanted him to work things out with his brothers and figured, you know, I'll let him go out in the field, spend some time with the brothers. Maybe they'll step away from the city in a quiet place in the field. They'll get into a, you know, a conversation. They'll work out their differences, perhaps. So perhaps that was Jacob's motivation for sending Joseph out into the field. But he comes out uh, to the field and he's lost. He can't find his brothers. And here we have an interesting exchange. A man meets him on the road. Now, our rabbis say this man was no ordinary man. He was an angel. But um, the verse says a man met him, which Rashi says was the angel Gabriel. And the man says, you look lost. What are you looking for? He says, I'm looking for my brothers. I came to find my brothers. Where are they? Have you seen them? And the man says, oh, I saw them leave. And I overheard them saying they're going to a place called Dosan. So Yosef says, okay, I'll go find them. And he heads out to go look for them, not in Shechem, but in Dosan. Now, this interaction between this man is very, besides it being an angel, which takes it to a deeper level, I'm sure every person could think of situations, you know, hypothetically, had Joseph not seen the brothers and not bumped into this man, quote, angel, he would have gone home and said, Dad, I looked for them. I couldn't find them. And he would have never been sold into a, thrown into a pit, never been sold as a slave, never been thrown into prison, but also never realized all his dreams as viceroy of Egypt and saving the entire country and region from famine. And in life, sometimes we also encounter people along the journey of life who alter our path. And when we look back, we say, you know, if not for that person, I would not have gotten to where I needed to get ultimately. 
So God sends these people. Now, these people may come as human beings, but they're also an angel as a messenger of God. So the idea of it being an angel represents that God sends a person to be a messenger from God to help you get to where you need to go. And even if at first, like in the case of sto a story of Joseph, it's a, it's a challenging route, but if ultimately it has to lead you to where you need to go. And we see this very clearly. But I once heard a beautiful interpretation from Rabbi Tversky on this verse. He says, if you look at Joseph, it's, 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 he's the most remarkable person because you find that there's only one person in the Torah that the Torah refers to as a successful person. A successful person. So who is that person who the Torah refers to as a successful person? It's Joseph. Joseph is called a successful person in the Torah. Why? Because no matter what circumstance he's put into, when he's sold into slavery in Egypt, into the house of Potiphar, he becomes the chief butler. The, his master trusts him with everything. When he is thrown into prison, the warden of the prison makes him in charge of all the other prisoners. Um, because he's once again so successful at what he does. And then, of course, he rises to the second most powerful position in the land to become viceroy of Egypt. And the question is, how did he do that? You know, usually when people go through hardships, they become bitter, they become despondent, they become depressed. How does he maintain his positivity and his, and you'll see throughout the story, his faith in God, despite all the circumstances? And our rabbis say that if you look at the story, of the angel meeting him along the way, the angel says to him, or this man says to him, what do you seek? And perhaps this question is the key. In other words, in life, sometimes we are responding to others rather than following our own inner, uh, our own inner dreams and vision. So we become reactive instead of proactive. Uh, we become outer driven rather than inner driven. So the angel says, look, you're about to go on a very difficult journey. You're going to be thrown into a pit and then into slavery and then uh, into prison. Here's the key. Always ask yourself, what do I seek? Keep your eye on the ball, on the prize, as they say. Don't get distracted. Don't allow circumstances or events you know, all the injustice that your brothers did to you, that your master's wife accused you falsely of seducing her and had you thrown into prison. It's very easy to fall into self-pity, into anger, into depression, into feeling sorry for yourself. And then you become paralyzed by the numbness of, of, of depression and sadness, and then you can't progress. You have to remember, no matter what happens to you, always ask yourself, what do I want? You have a dream, Joseph, right? You have visions, you have plans, you have grand ideas. Stay focused on those ideas and don't let anyone knock you off course. And that is the, um, that is the, the message that the angel was sent to deliver to Joseph. Always ask yourself, what do you seek? And here we come to the pivotal story. The brothers see Joseph approaching and they say, ah, here comes the dreamer. They call him by his nickname, the, the, the dreamer. That's what they call him. And at this point, they say, let us kill him. Let us kill him. And let us throw him into one of the pits here in the field. And we'll go home to our father and say, a wild animal devoured him. And then they say to themselves, and then we'll see what will happen with his dreams. He has all these big dreams. We're going to bow down to him. We'll throw him in a pit and let's see how his dreams are going to come about after we throw him in a pit to die. At this point, there's one son. And this is a shocking story. Eleven brothers, all sons of Jacob grandchildren of Isaac, great-grandchildren of Abraham. They came from a great family. How is it that they basically, what you would call today, attempted murder? 
and not just of anyone, but your own brother. Well, there's one son who has a conscience and doesn't want this to go forward. But our rabbis say he didn't have the courage to stand up to his other 10 brothers. So Ruvain speaks up and the Torah says he had a plan to save his brother. And what does he say? He says, why should we kill him and throw his corpse, his dead body into the pit? That means we're gonna physically murder our brother and then throw his corpse into the pit. Why don't we do the following? Throw him into the pit alive and then he'll just die on his own in the pit instead of us having to physically kill him. And Ruben figured, if they throw him in the pit, I'll come back later at night and rescue him. He had good intentions. But unfortunately, they took his advice, threw him in the pit alive. But then Ruben left the scene. He went back to take care of his father. As the oldest son, he had certain duties at home. And while he was away, a caravan of Ishmaelites came along. And now Judah speaks up and says, you know what? Instead of letting him just die in the pit, you can make some money, make some cash. Let's pull him out of the pit and make a profit on him by selling him into slavery to these Ishmaelites. And that's what happens. They sell him to the Ishmaelites. And when Reuben comes back later in the evening to rescue his brother, he looks into the pit, he sees his brother's not there. He tears his clothing in mourning and he says, how will I ever face my father again when I allow something like this to take place? And the obvious lesson here is that in life, there's intentions and then there has to be actual execution. Reuben had good intentions. He meant well. He was a conscientious person. He, it bothered him that they were going to kill Reuven, unlike the other brothers who had no compulsions about doing it. But he didn't execute properly. Instead of standing up to the brothers, and our rabbis tell us something very beautiful in the Talmud, the rabbis say that had Reuven known that the Torah would record his efforts, he would have put Joseph on his shoulders and carried him back home. Because he would have said, let it be recorded that I rescued Joseph and I carried him on my shoulders back to his father. But because he didn't have the confidence, he was insecure, he doubted himself, he wasn't sure of himself. He didn't have the courage to take a stand against what, the immorality of the brothers. He came up with a scheme which was a roundabout way. Okay, I'll advise them not to just murder him and throw his corpse in the body, throw him into the pit and let him die on his own in the pit and I'll come back and get him later. And unfortunately the opportunity passed and he was never able to rescue his brother. And the story unfolded the way it unfolded with 22 years of hardship for Joseph and for a grieving father and a torn apart family. And the rabbi said, we have to learn from this that God is your witness. Sometimes we all have to make a choice of we're gonna do something that takes strength, takes courage, takes confidence. And sometimes we're unsure of ourselves. We don't have that confidence and therefore we have to realize that God is recording the story of our life and he's our true witness. And therefore we should know he is rooting for us. He's saying, go for it. This is the right thing. You got my backing, you got my blessings. You're doing the right thing. And we have to have faith in Hashem and God's faith in us that we can stand up for the right thing and not worry about what others are gonna say. Because this intimidation that Reuven felt from his brothers, which we call peer pressure, we all know what that feels like, right? Sometimes we're also motivated to do the right thing. Sometimes we have the right instincts, the right inclination, the right thoughts, the right feelings. And around us, people don't. And we think, why are they doing this? This is not right. We should do things differently. But nobody wants to be the one to stand up and, and, and cause waves, you know, make waves and, and be disruptive. So we sort of sit quietly and go with the flow. And the Torah is telling us that was Reuven's mistake, that he didn't stand up. He had an opportunity here to change the course of history in a positive way. He was right, they were wrong, but he was outnumbered. And sometimes when you're outnumbered in life, you think, well, if everyone else thinks otherwise, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not right. And instead of having confidence in his way of thinking that this was wrong and standing up to his brothers, he unfortunately kept quiet. And even though he had good intentions to rescue his brother, good intentions are not enough. 
You need to actually act on your good intentions. And that's a very important thing that many times we have good intentions, but the challenge is to actually stand up and act on our positive intentions and our beliefs and our what we stand for. And even if we're outnumbered, and that's really the story of the Jewish people, the Jewish people are always outnumbered. And if we believe the majority of the world, then we'll, you know, in every generation, they try to kill us. So, you know, anti-Semitism. So maybe if you believe what the world says about us, you know, you won't believe in yourself. But the Jewish people always believe in themselves. We know who we are. We know what we stand for. And even though 99.8% of the world doesn't agree with us, we're very happy to maintain our faith and our values and our beliefs despite everyone else. And we never buy into uh, the storyline of the world about the Jews because we have confidence in who we are. So here, Joseph is now taken down to Egypt and the brothers take his coat of many colors. They dip it in goat's blood and they come back to their father, Jacob. And they say, we found the coat of Joseph and knowing how much love Jacob had for Joseph, you can imagine how he mourned and he cried over the loss of his sons. And the Torah says very clearly that all of his sons and all of his daughters and daughter-in-laws and his entire family tried to comfort Jacob over the loss of his son Joseph, but he refused to be comforted. And he actually said, I will go down to the grave mourning for my son. And then the Torah tells us that the Midianites uh, went to Egypt and they sold Joseph to one of the ministers of Pharaoh, who was the Chamberlain of the, the Chamberlain of the butchers. And Joseph is now a slave in the house of one of Pharaoh's ministers by the name of Potiphar. Now, here's something very interesting. We are now at the point where the brothers tell Jacob that your son was killed by a wild animal. He's mourning back at home in Israel for his son, thinking his son is dead. Joseph is a slave in a foreign land in the house of Potiphar in Egypt. And you would think the story would continue now with how one day there's a famine and there's no food. And, you know, or the other episode where... Um, what happens to Joseph in the house of his master, how the wife falls in lust with him and wants to sleep with him and tries to seduce him and he rejects her and then he ends up in prison. But right in the middle of this whole Parsha, chapter 38, seems to have nothing to do with the story of Joseph and the brothers. And when you see a story within a story, you have to ask yourself, what is the story doing in the middle of this story? We're in the middle of talking about Joseph and the brothers and suddenly the Torah goes to a story about Judah. So the question is, what is the story? So here's the story. It's, a, it's like a sidebar story, but we'll explain in a moment how it actually ties into the story of Joseph and the brothers. Chapter 38, right in the smack in the middle of the Torah portion, tells the story of Judah, Judah's family. Judah had three sons. And his oldest son, his name was Er. His second son, his name was Onan. And then his third son was Shelah. So he had Er, Onan, and Shelah. Three sons. Now his first son, Er, marries a woman by the name of Tamar. This is what the Torah tells us in chapter 38. But unfortunately, the first son dies. So now, Tamar is a widow. Now, the tradition was in those days that if a brother died, the next brother would marry her. So they could have children and create a child in memory of the deceased brother. It's called Yibum. So the brother, Onan, marries Tamar. But tragically, he dies too. So now Judah lost two sons married to the same woman. So again, according to the tradition, the third son, Shelah, should marry Tamar. However, Judah is very uh, skeptical or hesitant, reluctant to give over his third son to this woman because 
all he knows is that his first two sons met, died marrying, living married to this woman. So maybe, maybe she, uh, there's something about her that brings this misfortune upon her husbands. So he says to Tamar, I'm not ready to get to marry off Shale yet. You wait. In due time, I'll let you marry my third son, Shela. But he never had any intentions of giving over Shela to Tamar. He was just, uh, you know, being disingenuous because he didn't want to give over Shela to Tamar. Tamar realizes what's going on. And what does she do? In a remarkable story, she hears that Judah is coming to a place called Timna uh, to shepherd his flock, Judah, to shear the flock, shear the sheep. So she takes off her clothing of mourning that she was wearing for her last husband, and she covers herself with a veil and wrapped herself up, and she sat at the crossroads on the road toward Timna, where Judah was going. Because she saw that Judah was not giving her his third son to marry, and she wanted to have a child from the house of Judah. Now the Talmud talks about she saw through divine prophecy that the dynasty of King David, which eventually will lead to the coming of Mashiach, all from the loins of King David, and she wanted to have that child from this relationship with the family of Judah, which she eventually does have. So what does she do? She disguises herself as a harlot, as a prostitute. And she stands on the side of the road and she engages Judah and she goes with him and she lies with him and she's intimate with him. And when it's time for Judah to pay her for her services, he doesn't have any money on him. So she says, okay, he says, I'll give you my signet ring, my staff, and my wrap as a collateral, and I'll send payment later. And of course, what happens is after Judah goes home, he sends payment for this woman, this harlot, but the servants come back and they say, we don't see any woman on the side of the road. You know, she's not there anymore. Obviously, Tamar wasn't there anymore. Later, when they discover that Tamar is pregnant, Judah summons her because she was supposed to be in waiting for the third son. She wasn't supposed to be with any other man. And in an act of tremendous uh, self-sacrifice, Tamar doesn't want to shame Judah and say, you're the one who got me pregnant. So what does she do? She sends a box. It doesn't say it was a box, but she sends these three items, the signet ring, the wrap, and the staff. And she says, tell Judah, my father-in-law, that the one to whom these three items belong is the one from whom I'm pregnant. And boom, the light goes off in Judah's mind. He realizes that this woman on the side of the road that he engaged with was actually his daughter-in-law. And she's pregnant from his seed. And Judah admits, he doesn't deny it, even though she gave him a room to deny it because she didn't point a finger at him. But what does she say? She says, he says, she is more righteous than I am. And it's all my fault. I take responsibility that this came about because I didn't give over my son, Shayla, for her to marry. She gives birth to twins as a result of this union. One is named Peretz. And the second one is called Zarach. And Peretz, who is the older son, uh, becomes the progenitor of King David and the dynasty of all the Jewish kings leading all the way to Mashiach. So, and then after chapter 38 of this whole story with Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar, we resume the story where we left off earlier about Joseph coming to Egypt and his master's wife laying eyes on him trying to seduce him, to sleep with her. And he rejects her, runs out of the house. She remains holding on to his coat. And when her husband comes home, she tells her husband, who is this slave boy, this Jewish slave boy you brought into the house? Every day he comes upon me. And today I, um, you know, chased him out of the house. I started yelling at him and he ran out and left the coat in my hands. And as a result of that, he's a minister of Pharaoh, this uh, Potiphar. 
So he goes and he informs Para to put him in jail and Joseph is arrested and thrown into prison in Egypt for the crime of trying to seduce or rape the wife of his master. This is the next chapter, chapter 39. But the question is, why do we get into this whole story of Judah? And one of the beautiful interpretations is as follows, that what was going on with Joseph and the brothers? The brothers were the family of Jacob. They lived in Israel. They were an insular family. They kept to themselves. They didn't mingle in the worldly affairs. They had a Jewish uh, mission and purpose in this world, and they didn't believe in assimilation. And they didn't want to assimilate with the world. All of a sudden, one of the sons comes along, Joseph, and he has these grand ideas that he's going to be a ruler, powerful leader. Everyone's going to bow down to him. And the brothers said, what is this idea that you have that you're going to go out and rule over the world? Like, that's not what we Jews do. We stay within our own family and community. We don't go and try to influence and change the world. Why? Because if you go out in the world, the world could seduce you. The world could tempt you. It could lead you astray. It could lose your Jewish heritage and identity. So when they saw Joseph coming, they said, you know what? Joseph thinks that he could resist the temptations of the world, that he could be out there, so to speak, leave the capsule of the Jewish family and rule over the whole world and still remain loyal and righteous and devoted to his Jewish heritage. Let's put it to the test. We'll send them off on a, uh, into Egypt. We'll sell them to a group of uh, Ishmaelites. We'll send them into Egypt. And let's see if we could withstand the test of being a Jew in a foreign land. And that's what they do. They send them off into Egypt. Meanwhile, Judah, who was the one who said, let's throw him, let's take him out of the pit and sell him into slavery because we want to put him in the world of Egypt and see how he fears out there. What happens to him? he gets seduced by a harlot on the side of the road and succumbs to the temptation and sleeps with her and procreates with her. And the Torah is perhaps showing the contrast that Joseph who went into Egypt remained righteous in Egypt. And indeed, Joseph is the only biblical figure that's called Hatzadik, the righteous one, Joseph, the righteous one. That even in the midst of Egypt, with all of his good looks, because he was beautiful of appearance, beautiful of form, and his master's wife wants to sleep with him. She wants to seduce him. And there was nobody home. The Torah says there was nobody in the house when she came upon him. He could have gotten away with it, so to speak. And he was far away from his family in Israel. Nobody would know. Nobody would know anything. But yet, he had the moral conviction not to do anything immoral or inappropriate. He maintained his values and his beliefs, even in a country far away, immoral country like Egypt, when his master's wife, and he's a, he's a lowly slave. If he could sleep with his master's wife, that would raise his self-confidence, his, his, his esteem in her eyes, his importance. But yet he maintains his royal inner bearings and didn't uh, capitulate to her requests. On the other hand, Judah, who was with the family in the land of Israel, who thought that he had the, the spiritual high ground he succumbs to this woman on the side of the road. The Torah is showing us a very important lesson that more than your uh, environment or circumstances, it's mostly dependent, obviously, on your own inner convictions and strength. That you could be like Joseph and you could find yourself in a foreign land, uh, even a place like Egypt, uh, which was not the holiest environment. Um, and yet, remain true to yourself and to your beliefs and to your values and not compromise yourself in any way. On the other hand, you could be like Judah living amongst your family in the land of Israel with your parents, home and everything, Jacob, and yet give way to your own temptation and desire. And therefore, when they put Joseph to the test, they realized that he was right, that he could be, you know, you could be a Jew and you could also at the same time have an influence on the larger, wider world. You don't have to remain insular. Uh, Joseph wanted to be a universalist. He wanted to go out and impact the whole world. And he did. And he felt he would not lose himself in the process. It's not easy. Unfortunately, many Jews have lost themselves. 
and their Jewish identity in the desire to go out and impact the whole world. But it's possible, like Joseph, Joseph is the paradigm and the example that it's possible to both be a particularist, to be a Jew and to be a proud Jew and an observant Jew and maintain your, your faith and your beliefs and your values and your Torah. And at the same time, be a or lagayim, a light unto the nations, save the whole country from famine. And that's actually the ideal. The ideal is that we are not just insular, but that we go out and impact and shape and benefit the whole world with our lights, with the light of Torah, with the light of righteousness. And Yosef uses his ability to interpret dreams and to use tremendous wisdom in saving an entire region from famine. So now we come to chapter 40, which is after Joseph is thrown into prison, falsely accused of trying to seduce his master's wife. And here we come to the closing section of the Torah portion, which is the beginning of the turn of events in the life of Joseph. What happens? What happened was he's in prison. And again, Joseph is the only one in the Bible that's called a successful man. Um, a successful man. And imagine you meet somebody and they say, you say, how are your kids? Oh, my son is so successful. Really? What does he do? He's in prison, but he's such a good inmate that the warden of the prison put him in charge of all the other prisoners. He lets him help him run the prison. You would look at the guy like he's crazy. This is Nachas. This is someone you're proud of. This is your son who's successful, that he's the chief uh, a prisoner. He oversees all the other inmates. But yet the Torah refers to Joseph as a successful man. Why? Because success is not always the outcome. We don't always control the outcome of our lives. Joseph couldn't control his life events. His brothers threw him in a pit. They sold him into slavery. He was accused falsely, thrown into prison. He can't be faulted for his circumstances. It's what you make of your circumstances. If you rise to the top and do the best you can in every given circumstance, and you show excellence in whatever it is you're put into, any situation you do the best, that makes you successful. And therefore, since Joseph was a model prisoner, so much so that he gained the trust of the warden, and also in the butler's house, he was appointed in charge of the entire household, that's why he's referred to as a successful person. And the lesson is very clear that we always have to just do the best we can in every given circumstance. And if we're doing the very best we can, then by definition, we are successful according to the Torah's definition of success. But when he's overseeing all the prisoners, there were two other inmates with him amongst the inmates. One was the uh, Sarha Mashkin, the, the chief uh, cupbearer, the one who served Pharaoh his drinks, the, the bartender, so to speak. And then there was the Sarah Ophim, the chief baker in the kitchen of Pharaoh. And they were both thrown into prison for whatever reasons. And one day, Joseph looks at them and he sees they look very distressed. They look unhappy. They look like their faces are long. And he says to them, Why do you look so downcast? Fallen today. And they say we had very d disturbing dreams and we can't make any sense of them. So Joseph says, tell me the dream. Maybe God will help me find the interpretation. Again, you see Joseph's humility that he's not going to find the interpretation. God will lead him to the interpretation. And sure enough, what happens? They tell him the dreams. And what does Joseph say? Joseph says to one of them, uh, the butler, I have good news for you. The interpretation of your dream, and we won't get into the whole dream now, is that you will be taken out of prison, you will be released in three days from now, and you will be restored to your post, and you will serve Pharaoh his drinks once again. On the other hand, he tells the baker, unfortunately, your dream means the opposite, that you're going to be taken out of prison, but not to be restored to your post and your position, but unfortunately, they're going to hang you, and the birds are going to eat from your flesh. Like in the dream, the birds were eating from his baskets of bread, as opposed to the butler's dream where he was squeezing the grapes and serving Pharaoh. And this leads to next week's Torah portion when Pharaoh has his dreams about the fat cows and the skinny cows and the sheaves, skinny sheaves of grain, eating the fat, robust sheaves of grain. He's very perturbed by his dreams. The butler says, ah, 
I know a guy in prison, I mapped, who knows how to interpret dreams. Joseph's pulled out of prison, interprets Paro's dreams, and the rest of the history becomes the viceroy of Egypt. But just one very interesting point, and that is that, you know, Yosef, like we said, he had this tremendous ability to remain positive on, under every circumstance. A normal person would be dejected, would be depressed, would be wallowing in self-pity. Look what happened to me. I'm a good boy. And look what happened. My brothers throw me into a pit. And then things get worse. I become a slave in Egypt. And then things get worse. I'm accused falsely and I'm thrown into prison. And he could have spent the rest of his life feeling sorry for himself. And he would have never become the viceroy of Egypt, brought his family down and reunited with his whole family. So one of the things you see is that if I ask you, can you pinpoint the turning point in Joseph's life? Where do things start? You know, talk about the V-shaped shape recovery. Like, where does it hit rock bottom? And where does it start turning in an upward trend? The pinpointed place would be right here. One morning, Joseph awakens in the prison. And he sees that two inmates look sad, look despondent. And he says to them, why do you look so sad today? Is everything okay? And they tell him about the dreams. This interaction of him asking them, why do you look sad today, led to his interpreting their dreams, which led to the butler going free, which led to the butler telling Pharaoh when he had his dreams, I know someone who can interpret dreams, which led to Joseph being taken out of prison to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, which led to Pharaoh being so impressed with his interpretation that he appoints him viceroy of Egypt, which led to the brothers coming to buy food, which led to Joseph revealing himself to his brothers, which led to Joseph bringing his father back to, down to Egypt to be reunited with him and led to the family being together once again in Egypt. But it all started from a very simple interaction. Good morning. Are you okay? You don't look so happy today. Now, first of all, why would somebody look happy in prison? You're in prison. Of course, you're not happy. But he saw they didn't look, they look more awful today than any other day. They look sadder than usually. And had Joseph been self-absorbed and feeling sorry for himself, he would have no empathy for anyone else. He would be just worried about himself. The fact that he wasn't consumed with himself, he was able to notice that somebody else didn't look good today. And he had enough compassion to ask them, what's bothering you? And even though he was accused falsely by a minister of Pharaoh, he worked for the butcher, the minister of the meat, and these were the other guys who worked in the kitchen, the, the bartender guy, the, 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 the cup bearer, the baker. He goes, oh, these are friends of my former master, that bunch of corrupt, rotten, evil people. Let them all be depressed. Let them die in prison. Who cares? No, just because his master did something awful and accused him falsely and threw him into prison didn't mean that every other servant of Pharaoh deserves to be treated badly. He said, Maybe the baker is a good guy. Maybe the, but, the butler is a good guy, the, the cup bearer. Let me help him out. He looks sad. That ability to rise above his circumstances to care about someone else is what was literally the key that unlocked his own prison gate, which led to a whole sequence of events that led to a happy ending to the story. And what you see here is that a simple interaction, like asking somebody, is everything okay? You don't look so happy today and really genuinely caring and asking the question in a way that the person feels you really want to know the answer. You're not just going through some niceties and formalities. Ah, how are you? How's everything? No, you really want to know and you really want to help the person. You're going to give them the time to listen to their problem and to help them solve their problem and find a solution. That was the key to his own redemption. And the lesson is very obvious that when you help others uh, unbind their own bondage we release ourselves in the process as well joseph was trying to help the butler and the baker unbeknownst to him he was actually setting up uh, the circumstances that would lead to his own freedom and when we're less focused on ourselves and more focused on others what what, what we do for others ultimately comes back for us and that ultimately leads to joseph's freedom in next week's Torah portion. So it's quite a remarkable story, um, although a very troubling and painful story of brothers betraying another brother and throwing him into a pit and selling him into slavery. But Yosef is really a, a role model, an example of faith and courage and 
confidence under all circumstances and rising to the top. You know, we're going to Hanukkah this Thursday night. We're going to have Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is about oil, the miracle of oil. And the nature of oil is that it always floats to the top. But at the same time, it also permeates very deeply. You know, if you get oil on your clothing, it's almost impossible to get it out because oil saturates everything very, very deeply. At the same time, oil, you mix it with any other liquid, it rises to the top. And the message is that we have to have this dual uh, dimension to us. The property of oil that we rise to the top, the Jews have to rise to the top. We have to be a light unto the nations. We have to elevate ourselves. We have to be an example. We have to re stand above the fray, as they say. But at the same time, from our position, we have to saturate the whole world with our goodness and righteousness and permeate the whole world like oil permeates everything and leaves a lasting permanent impression. And that's the dual challenge of the menorah. And that's really the lesson of Joseph. Joseph rises to the top under all circumstances. He rises to the top. If he's a prisoner, he's the best prisoner. If he's a slave in the house, of he's the best slave. Always the best, always rising to the top. Comes out of prison, he interprets dreams for the butler, for the baker, for fire, always rising to the top. But then through his genius and through his faith in God, he devises a plan with God's inspiration to save an entire region from famine. And that's where you see Joseph influencing the whole world. Yes, we have to remain apart. Oil doesn't mix with water. Jews have to remain apart to remain distinct, to remain unique, to remain loyal to our heritage, our beliefs, our faith, and not mingle to the extent of assimilation and losing our identity. But at the same time, we should not be a part of the world, separate from the world, to remain a part, but we have to be a part of the world, meaning that we have to take what we have, our Torah, our Judaism, our faith, everything we have, and make sure that we're saturating the world with oil, with light, with goodness, with righteousness to permeate and to affect goodness in the whole world, to be that example, the light unto the nations, like the light of the menorah, to create warmth and light all around us. So wishing everyone a wonderful day and a happy Hanukkah. Tonight we have a Zoom with APAC to talk about the recent elections and the impact on Israel. I welcome everyone to join us. Thursday night we'll be lighting the menorah in uh, Royal Poinciana Plaza if you want to sign up for that. And also we're having a big Zoom concert with a comedian and a singer on Thursday night as well. Hope you'll join us for all of that as well. So have a wonderful, wonderful day, everyone. Shavuot Tov and happy Hanukkah to everyone.